your response if you don't let me uh, do a couple of factoids. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah. So much for saying to you, the TV folks are taking a very 30-second minute break, and if we keep uh, going back and forth, we'll use up the 30 seconds very quickly. 50% uh, of the electricity generated in the United States is from coal, underscoring uh, the role that it plays. Uh, the future looks like it will be coal-oriented if you take seriously that we are now building 30 coal-powered plants that are under construction now that will burn 70 million tons of coal per, per year. You've already noted that uh, in 1948, we produced the same amount of coal we produced in 2008, and then we had 125,000 workers, and this year we had 20,000. Uh, we're making the transition, I think, to talk about uh, surface mining. And surface mining uh, comprised 40% of the coal production in 2008. Bobby's point is that uh, it is simply not environmentally compatible at all to do surface mining, and there's no case that can be made for that. Uh, you might have a different view. <laughs> Well, first thing, I think that this debate is similar to the environmental movement. You know, the playing by the rules is important if you're going to get the right answer. But uh, so we need an adequate amount of time to respond to I don't know how many different issues. If there are truly more people employed in the windmill than there are in the coal business, then they've got a real problem because they produce about 1% of electricity and we produce about 50%. So the, there's a real issue there. Uh, solar energy, by the way, it, it works well in the daytime. It gets cold at night. A real problem. A lot of those solar components, by the way, in those panels are made outside the country. Windmills are primarily going to be made in India and China. Mr. Kennedy is on record as having said that recently that we realize that the construction of windmill parts and so forth will be made overseas. I don't really know how you respond to, uh, you know, an ongoing speech about these issues. I, I really feel badly about that, but to the question of how we're going to be prosperous when we use coal, uh, well, you, you better realize that that's what made us prosperous to begin, begin with. It's what make, is making the Chinese prosperous. They were at 700 million tons of coal in 1980. Uh, today they're at 3 billion. If you're going to think you're going to lower the mercury content in the ocean by reducing mercury in the United States, only 1%, not 60 or 70% of the mercury that's uh, landing in the United States is coming off of U.S. coal-powered power plants, about 60% of it is coming from other sources, a great percentage of it is coming off of Asian coal production. We're in a situation where we compete in the world and we're trying to, uh, if you will, have totally open markets. It's going to be very difficult for this country to compete with the labor standards it has, with the environmental standards it has and so forth, let alone with the energy costs that would come with windmills and solar panels. We've already lost this people in this room know Century Aluminum. We've lost nearly every aluminum plant. We lose our chemical plants because we try to use natural gas to make electricity, which is an entirely inappropriate use for natural gas because it should use, be used in bakeries and industrial processes and the cost should be kept low. If we follow many of the policies that the environmentalists want us to follow, we're going to cause our homes to be as dependent on foreign energy as we've caused our cars to be. You can't build a refinery in this country. When, when, he, when Mr. Kennedy talks about not being able to eat the fish, the Chinese and the, and the Indians burn four billion tons of coal and eat their fish uncooked out of the China Sea. If the mercury was a real problem, they'd all be dead. They wouldn't be living until they're 79 years old. You have to think about things in a practical way rather than believing what you hear in the media or what you can read. You can read it and hear anything that you want to hear. But can this country and this state and the world make a, a, a prosperous society out of coal? Yes. If you look around the world, the places that are prosperous have electricity, and most of that low-cost electricity is made from fossil fuels. It is true that natural gas can play a big role. It's true that nuclear can be a, play a big role. It's true that windmills and solar panels can play a big role. But the idea that you're going to stop all surface mining in West Virginia over water like this, many of you might think this is drinking water, this is discharged water that violates the EPA standard while you're trying to compete with Chinese slave labor and people that don't even have to get a permit is atrocious, it's just not going to happen. You have to make choices in life and these surface mines recover 
a lot of reserves and a lot of energy that could not otherwise be recovered. They don't have any meaningful pollution, although the media would have you believe that. And they, people aren't sleeping with their clothes on because they're afraid that an impoundment's going to break. The impoundment in the school that made so much press coverage in West Virginia were there when I was in grade school. We, we reclaimed, we massed the energy, the two most dangerous impoundments in West Virginia, which were at Montco and stared at Willing Pitt and Logan County. The one at Willing Pitt was a subject of a WVU study. Again, you're criticizing people in the coal industry who have gone to school, become engineers and geologists, and become professional people who are employing your friends and your neighbors in the best way they know how and creating a great economy for this state and for this area, and also providing low-cost electricity to this country that allows it to be competitive in a marketplace that it otherwise could not be competitive in. And it's easy to spout out rhetoric, but the truth of the matter is that if were it not for coal, we wouldn't have the freedom to sit up here and discuss it. Don, I've seen the studies that have uh, projected that by 2020 there would be, you'll get, you've, you've had chances and you'll get them. <laughs> I've seen studies that have said that by 2020 that there'll be a 40 to 50 percent uh, decline in coal production in central Appalachia. Uh, do you think that it is time for the economic health of West Virginia to begin to diversify the economy? And if we were to diversify it, our alter is alternative energy a part of that? It's been time to diversify since 1890. It's always good to have a diverse economy. It's not coal that's keeping us from having a diverse economy, except it lulls the politicians to sleep, and they think because they have all this revenue off of coal that they don't have to worry about the future. But the truth of the matter is that the reason businesses aren't in West Virginia is because they get through the daylights out of them and because they tax them to death and because they, they don't feel comfortable being in a state that has no punitive damage limitations. If coal is driving businesses out of the state, why is the chemical belt here in Charleston shutting down? It's shutting down because we drove natural gas prices to be so volatile that they run from $4 up to $12 and the chemical industry can't survive. So where do they go? They go overseas because we have open trade borders and they produce the coal and other, or the chemicals in other countries without any labor requirements and with very few uh, environmental requirements and therefore you lose the jobs that you had here in Charleston. If the forecasts are accurate that we're going to have a 30, 40, 50 percent increase in the demands for energy in the United States and around the world, uh, can alternative energies uh, handle that, or do we have to find ways to make coal work? Um, well, I, I, I want to answer that. Let me just reply to a couple of things that, that Don said. One is the, the statistics I got about, that I t talked about from, about the wind energy come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. There's 85,000 people in 2008 employed in the wind industry. There's 81,000 the same year employed as miners. The, jo the jobs in the wind industry, industry are very high paying, but more money goes to the workers. In your industry, for example, in your company, you actually take home more money some years than all your shareholders combined. So what the mining industry does, it makes a few people rich by making everybody else poor, whereas the wind industry distributes wealth and distributes the, uh, the benefits of that industry more evenly. If you want to know what happened in Japan from eating all that mercury, Google Minamata disease and you'll see something that will make your hair rate rise on end. Uh, it's one of the most horrific episodes in history. Um, yes, the answer is yes. I want to also say, reply to what you said about China. China is, is very dependent on coal and it recognizes now that coal is the principal drag. Its reliance, its deadly addiction to coal is its principal is the principal drag on capitalism and economic growth in its country. And it is now, and it recognizes also that the green energy economy is the future. China has committed this year to spend $7 trillion over the next five years developing its wind and solar energy, more than it's spending on its military. It sees this as a new arms race. We have been leading the world in wind deployment for the past 10 years. We're leading also, we're one of the leaders in solar deployment. We are building solar plants all over this country, and they're all being put out of business because of the investment that's being put in in China. China understands China is going to increase its solar deployment between now and 2020 by 20,000 percent. We plan to increase ours by 37 percent. 
They understand, and this, if we don't switch to renewables right now, and if this state doesn't think about how to start switching, we're gonna be buying energy, we're gonna be buying green technology from the Chinese for the next 100 years, the same way that we've been buying oil from the Saudis for the last 100. We need to get out ahead of this curve and start, and start investing in these things and start thinking ahead and demanding our politicians build the infrastructure within our states and start, and start subsidizing infrastructure to compete with the huge subsidies that we give to the carbon incumbents to coal and oil. I wanna say this, I'm in this industry. I'm building these plants right now. I'm, I'm on a board of a company called BrightSource which is building the biggest solar thermal plant in the world, 2.7 gigawatts, the biggest power plant in America. We're building it in California, and we're building it at the same cost per gigawatt you could build a coal plant, about $3 billion a gigawatt. But once we build that plant, it's free energy forever. Once you build the coal plant, now you gotta go cut down the Appalachian Mountains and ship them across the country in coal cars, warp every train track in this country so we can't have high-speed rail, build the, the, the roads, the coal haul roads so thick in West Virginia at taxpayer expense that it's costing this state $200 million a year to build and maintain them, a sudden other subsidy to coal, then you gotta burn this stuff, poison every river and lake in America, kill 60,000 Americans with ozone and particulates, cause a million asthma attacks a year, sterilize all the, the lakes in the Adirondacks. These are the true costs of coal. Once you build a solar plant, it's free, it's free energy forever. The photons are hitting our country every day for free. All we've got to do is pick them up. We build at the same price we can build coal. You can build wind plants even cheaper than you can build a coal plant. And guess what? The Midwest of our country is the Saudi Arabia of wind. We have more wind in the, North Dakota is the windiest place on the planet. We have enough wind in North Dakota, Montana and Texas to provide 100% of the energy needs in this country for the next 50 years. We have enough solar in an area, and this is from the Scientific American peer-reviewed study, 75 miles by 75 miles in the desert southwest to provide 100% of the energy needs of our country, even if every American owned an electric car. We use about 1,000 gigawatts a, a year, by or day, uh, during peak demand. 500 of those are carbon. To eliminate those and replace them with solar and wind will cost us $1.3 trillion. That's about half the price of the Iraq war. We have free energy forever. We never have to give all that money to Iraq. and We don't have to poison the people and impoverish the people of Appalachia in order to do it. This okay. is a real solution for our country, and it's one we ought to be embracing, and we need to embrace, as Senator Byrd said, right here in West Virginia, instead of trying to build an economy, a 19th century economy, a 19th century future, by looking into a rear view mirror. Okay. Let me respond to that, if you will. You know, it's fine to sit up here and say that the Chinese are going to spend trillions of dollars on solar panels. I spent most of December in China, and I tell you that they're planning on burning 200 to 300 million tons of coal each year than they burned the previous year. Their increase in coal burn is about the equivalent of West Virginia's total production every six months. Uh, they're building 60,000 megawatts of coal-fired electric power and 10,000 megawatts of wind power. Most of the time, they're building the wind power just to appease people. They're putting pressure on them, you know, whether it's the UN or the US or wherever. Doesn't matter how you cut it. Uh, we're sitting up here talking about theories. We have a $12 trillion uh, debt. We have a $2 trillion or one and a half to $2 trillion deficit. We have 15, 16 million Americans out of work. Whatever you know, we're going to do, we need to do things that are practical. I mean, we can talk all we want that uh, you know, you're going to get all these photons and they're going to create all this electricity. The truth of the matter is, if that was the case, that's what would be happening. They wouldn't have to have the government subsidies. There wouldn't be a lot of talking going on about it because we do have free enterprise. If it was extremely profitable to build solar panels or to build windmills, that's what would be happening. This company is pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into the coal business, as are other coal companies, because that's where the investment will pay off in a free enterprise market. It's, it's very difficult to listen to this rhetoric and understand that it's, uh, it's just not the case. I mean, if you could build windmills and solar panels, the Indians and the Chinese and the rest of the world would be building windmills and solar panels. And it's just, it doesn't make any sense to uh, have a dialogue when we're throwing out all kinds of things that uh, just simply aren't true. Okay, I, I briefly. Reply, uh, uh, 
Um, the, first of all, China is looking at this as an arms race, as the arms race of the future, and we are losing this arms race. As I said, we're building these plants all over. If you leave West Virginia, West Virginia is 99% dependent on coal, but you go to other areas of this country and you'll see wind plants. My, my home is completely powered by solar and geothermal. My home is a power plant. I produce more energy than I use, and it's a profitable one. And people all over the country could do it, and they are doing it, and they're doing it profitably. You don't see it in West Virginia because it's so because the coal industry is so dominant in this state that they just there. You know, there's a group here from Coal River Mountain that's trying to build a wind farm, and there's a study by uh, by Hendricks that shows by an MIT professor that shows if they build that 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 wind farm that it's gonna pay the county $1.7 million a year, that it's gonna employ 1,700 people to, to build the farm. It will employ 70 to 100 people permanently. Um, Mr. Blankenship's trying to cut down that ridge so that that wind farm will never be built. What are the uh, benefits to the county of that? $30,000 a year, 300 jobs, for maybe eight or nine years, and then what do you have? You have a five square mile pit that nobody can use for anything ever in history again. Is that the kind of future that you want in West Virginia? Or do you want a future that you can embrace, that you can be proud of, that you can show your children and love this state and preserve it for generations? I'm gonna make an effort to get a question in here and see if I can do that. Um, Don. Uh, as you've heard reference, Senator Byrd has said that uh, things are changing in the world and uh, mining needs to change as well. Uh, what do you think he was thinking about and do you agree that uh, we need to be making some changes in how we do mining? Well, we've been making changes in how we do mining for 100 years and it's gotten more and more efficient and more and more safe until the point that the coal mine safety is one of the safest industries in the in the country, it doesn't rank in the, the danger zones at construction. In fact, you're more likely to, probably several times more likely to get killed every hour you spend in a car than every hour you spend at a coal industry mine. Uh, but again, it's just phenomenal to, to listen to stuff. We did windmill studies uh, in Boone County to see if we could have a profitable windmill. And uh, as uh, Mr. Kennedy says, we're pretty good at making money. We concluded that a windmill in Boone County would not make money. Uh, the government is subsidizing a lot of these windmills, but make sure you know what a windmill is. It's a 400 foot high structure. Uh, you know, you're, you will probably kill, if you build enough windmills to displace coal in this country, you might as well say goodbye to the Indiana bats and all the birds because you're gonna kill millions of birds a year. It's, uh, you know, you're gonna employ a lot of Indians and a lot of Chinese, but you're not gonna employ a lot of Americans. Uh, I don't understand, if this is such a great thing, uh, let Mr. Candy and Mr. Gore go out there in the Mojave Desert and get past all the environmentalists out there that are trying to stop these solar panels because of a turtle or something and build it. And if it makes a lot of money, I can assure you that all of us will begin to invest in it. Let's see the solar panels become profitable. Let's see the windmills become profitable on their own. Uh, and I'm sure the investment will come without someone having to put all the people in central Appalachia out of work. Uh, you know, it, again, if it were true, it would be happening without somebody being in here trying to put thousands and thousands of coal miners out of work. He talks about uh, putting people out of work, and clearly there are communities uh, in West Virginia, there are communities in uh, Utah and other places that are totally dependent on the, the coal industry for their survival. Uh, what do you say fo to folks in those communities about uh, what should be their future and what can replace uh, coal as uh, support for those communities? Well, those communities are already, and I'm working in those communities right now, and those communities are very, very progressive. Colorado, particularly Governor Ritter, um, and, uh, and Utah also in constructing huge wind farms, huge solar th thermal plants. Um, that are on the books and under construction and already operating. I mean, I really, I'm kind of stunned that Mr. Blankenship doesn't know that this is going on in other states, that it's not just about coal. What I do agree with you with this, we should have free markets where there are no subsidies, but we should start by eliminating the huge subsidies that go to the carbon incumbents. Right now, um, there's, a, there's a book by Terry Tamminen called Lives for Gallon 
that very scrupulously and meticulously inventories the huge subsidies to the oil industry, which gets $1.3 trillion in subsidies every year from the oil depletion allowance and also you know, indirect subsidies from protecting the, the Gulf. It doesn't include, incidentally, the Iraq war, but $100 billion a year that we spend through our military protecting those Gulf lines. But the subsidies to coal are much larger than that. If you look at the externalities of your industry, the fact that today, according to the National Academy of Sciences and Natural Research Council and EPA, every waterway in this country is now poisoned by mercury from coal plants. What's the cost of that? That is a subsidy to your industry. You're, you know, I believe in free market capitalism. I believe in a true free market, you get efficiency, and efficiency means the elimination of waste, and pollution is waste. In a true free market, people would, would properly value our natural resources, and, and, but in a true free market, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich and without enriching your community. But what Mr. Blankenship does is he makes himself rich by making everybody else poor. He raises standards of living for himself by lowering quality of life for everybody else, and he does that. That industry, not just you, but the whole industry does it by escaping using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his production costs. In, in a true free market, the actor in the marketplace, the producer of product, has to pay the true cost of bringing his product to the marketplace. But what the coal industry does is it shifts the burden, and that includes the cost of cleaning up after yourself. But what the coal industry does is it shifts the burden of cleaning up after itself to the American public. So that you and I, through, through poor health, because from eating these fish, from the, not the, the, the inability now to eat the fish in the, in the United States, the freshwater fish, um, the ozone and particulates that sicken so many of our children, the acid rain, the carbon that we haven't even talked about, you know, with global warming, all of those costs are imposed on the rest of us. And the environmental laws are all intended to restore free market capitalism in our country okay. by forcing actors in the marketplace to pay the true cost of bringing their product to market. And if we did that, there is no way that your industry could compete against wind and solar in a true marketplace, because we can produce the energy much more efficiently. That, that coal is what made the Industrial Revolution possible. It's what made this country the strongest country in the world. It's what won World War I and World War II. It's the best hope we have for the future. I don't know where all this comes from about mercury is killing everything. One percent of the mercury landing in this country is from coal-fired power plants. Ninety-nine percent is from somewhere else. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you can get anything that you want to get on the internet, anything you get, want to get or want to pay for in a study. Uh, it's, it's really strange because if windmills were the thing to do, that would happen naturally. If solar panels are the thing to do, it will happen naturally. If the Chinese believe that windmills and solar panels are the best thing to do, they'll build 60,000 megawatts of power with solar panels and windmills and not build it with coal. They're building it with coal for a reason. They've determined it's the best way to raise the quality of life of the Chinese who live on about $4,700 a year, while we've depended on coal and we live on $47,000 a year. It's uh, pretty simple. If you use a little common sense, if you have an open market and if people are wanting to make money and make investments, the better choice for energy will prevail. And so far that's happened. I don't know where all these subsidies are supposedly coming from or where all our power went, but I feel powerless in terms of permits. I feel powerless in terms of being able to provide employment in West Virginia and the, and the tens of thousands of West Virginians that depend on it. If you're not in the coal business and you live in the U.S. or you live in West Virginia, you're dependent on the coal business for the five and six cent a megawatt hour cost of electricity you're getting. You're dependent on the coal business to fund your public pension plans, to fund your local fire station, to fo fund your ambulance service. We, we may have some externality costs. I'm not sure that we do or what they are, but the one thing I know is we provide a lot more to the communities than we take away from them because we are the communities. We are the communities. And the people that live in West Virginia deserve a chance to may stay in their communities. They don't need to have to move to the top of the Rocky Mountains to build a windmill. I, I don't understand at all how the other side continues to argue that all these other sources of electricity are the right sources 
when they're not the sources that are being chosen by anyone in the world that wants to electrify their communities. Do you understand or have empathy for uh, Don's uh, points when he's talking about the community-based nature of coal and the commitment of uh, communities uh, to that business and industry? Well, <clears throat> listen, I've been to Whitesville, West Virginia. I've been to Lindytown. I've been to Marfork. I've been to Schumann. I've been to Blair. And these are ghost towns. These were once thriving communities. They're surrounded by coal, and there's still people digging it, but they're digging it with mountaintop removal. And I was in Lindy uh, town recently. All the houses in it are boarded up, and the people have been paid to leave. And they're paid in their contracts. They're told they have to leave by a certain distance, and they have to stay away from it. These are communities that have been emptied. So I don't see how we can say that this industry is building sustainable communities when there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these communities everywhere that this company operates and where mountaintop removal exists all over the state. The first thing that they do is go in and they say to the people in the community, you've got to move. We're moving you out. How is that prosperity for that community? How is that sustainable economy? How is it even, you know, a, you know the Catholic Church has said that the, the 28 bishops of, of Appalachia, that mountaintop removal is sin because of what it does to the community. The Episcopalian bishops of Appalachia have said mountaintop removal is sin because of the impacts on human beings and the community. So, and I don't see how you can possibly argue that you're building communities through an industry that is destroying the entire environment. Don, are you building communities? <laughs> or what? What are you doing? Well, let me tell you, uh, it's not just the few towns in West Virginia that are ghost towns due to environmental extremism and so forth. Detroit and many of our cities are becoming ghost towns. The, uh, the extremism of the environmental movement and the uh, trade policies and the import of products is, uh, is the reason that tens of millions of people are either underemployed or unemployed. Uh, we all know that West Virginia survived the downturn better than most other states. Uh, so to blame issues about the economy on coal is, is disingenuous. Lindy Town, we didn't have to do anything at Lindy Town. We paid people more than their houses were appraised for, and, uh, and they voluntarily sold their home. If someone comes to you, we had no ability to force anyone out of their home. We were not near their homes. Uh, we find humor in that over here, I guess. But the truth of the matter if, is if we force someone out of their home, I would assume that the state police here tonight, they would arrest us for taking someone else's property. Uh, we have bought many homes in West Virginia. We have uh, done a lot of things that cleared areas so that we could mine. These people uh, have probably better homes than they had before. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the enviros want companies and individuals that manage companies to do when there's going to be an interaction with the mine the company other than go and offer fair and above fair prices for the properties. If we don't or aren't able to buy them, then we simply won't be able to mine the coal. Talk about it being a sin to do surface mining. I mean, the real sin is that the enviros want to focus us on one part per million of iron or focus us on some of this nonsense they talk about or talk about windmills when tens of millions of people are starving to death, when 10 million, 15, 17 million people in the United States are out of work. That's the real sin, is when you damage your neighbor based on theories of global warming, based on untruths, based on personal gain, like being invested in solar panels in the Mojave Desert, which is now being stopped by the enviros. That's the true sin. The people who are genuinely trying to create jobs, genuinely trying to produce energy in this country so we don't have to fund the terrorists overseas and they come over and blow our airplanes up and so forth, those are the people that are doing the right thing. The people who are out there standing in the, in the way of that are the ones that are wrong. Okay, and we're going to do another short transition. Harvey, please. Uh, so that means I get to talk at you?